this works. That's me. Uh, I am a ex-researcher and now a lecturer at the Ruhr University in Bochum. Um, I have no idea about crypto. I'm not a cryptographer. I am merely a user of the whole thing, um, and I'm basically coming from the classic field of web application security. I founded a company which is called Q53. We do penetration tests and audits, are located in Berlin in Germany, and uh, I spoke on a couple of conferences, mostly relating to web security topics. So why am I here? We'll see. Um, there is one bit of software that I maintain. You might have heard about this if you're actually building stuff out there with relations to web applications, browser add-ons, and those kinds of things, and that is DOM Purify, which is a sanitizer library that effectively has one purpose, and that is to sanitize HTML. You throw a string of HTML in that is like dirty, maybe or not, and what comes out is clean, and that's all that the library does, which is a fairly complex topic, but uh, yeah, someone has to do it. You can reach out to me if you want after this presentation, either via email or via phone, or signal or messenger, whatever suits you best. And I would say, let's get started. First, before we dive into the actual material, I want to do a small disclaimer. As mentioned, I know almost nothing about crypto or the underpinnings thereof. I never studied this, I never read into this. Um, I never, I don't really know much about banks, about financial systems, um, or how any of this works. Of course, I know a little bit because we're, oftentimes dealing with firms and banks and crypto startups and we audit wallets and we audit protocols. Um, but I personally have not that much of an idea about this. So you might wonder why am I standing here? I'm not for or against crypto in any way. This is not a political talk. It's an impulse talk, but it's not a political talk. I am, in fact, like an early bird holder, and uh, I actually do enjoy paying with crypto when it makes sense and when I have the possibility. And uh, I do also hope and believe that at some point things are going to be fine. And I also strongly believe that right now they're not. So let's talk about the structure of this presentation first. We have one chapter on browser history. I'm not really sure how many people here in this room have lots of experience with browsers from the security standpoint. And if there's not too many, then I'd like to pick you up a little bit on this and uh, basically teach the very, very basics of what to know about browser his history, browser security, and why I am actually here today. The second chapter maybe shows how naive I am on this whole topic because it's about crypto coins and my view on crypto coins and some of the views that I gathered from my team as well. Um, why we have them, what they actually intend to do, what they really do, how secure they really are, and where we are right now in terms of actual applica applicable or application security. And last but not least, we have a third chapter that is about do what now? How, how do we fix this? Is there anything to fix? Can we do better? Where should we invest our energy into? Let's see. And hopefully we can have like a small discussion afterwards and a little bit of Q&A and just like see what you think about that topic and what your inputs are because I'm very curious about those as well. So let's talk about browser history. Who here knows a little bit about browser history? Like starting in the 90s and so on. Fantastic. Yes, two, three, four, five people. Amazing. <laughs> yes, and, and everything would be better if that was the case. So let's talk about the very beginning. And uh, note we're right now in like the mid 90s. And in the beginning, there was hypertext. And hypertext sounds amazing, and it totally is amazing. It's effectively structured text with a little bit of hyper added to it. And when we're talking about hyper, we're talking about anchors, we're talking about images, potentially animations, animated GIFs, and maybe videos or other objects that we embed from other places like Java applets and these kinds of things. They don't really exist anymore, they don't have any relevance anymore, but we had them back then and they were super important and then people realized how bad Java actually is when running as a plugin in the browser and that there's like gazillions of vulnerabilities. But at the end of the day, hypertext is nothing else but semantically structured text with a little bit of hyper that gives us some interactivity to the whole thing. We have HTML that gives us the structure, hypertext markup language. And of course, we want to transport the whole stuff from A to B, and we use for that HTTP hypertext transfer protocol. And HTML and HTTP are relatively simple. I mean, they were built in the 90s, and we're going to have a look at a couple of examples very, very soon. Here we have an HTTP request. That is something that is often still happening today. Here we're working with HTTP 1.1. Now we use HTTP 2.0, which is not that different structurally. It's just like transferred differently. And as you can see, there is a bunch of pairs of 
names and values. For example, we see here, do I have laser? I have laser. We see the name that is host, and we see the value that is www.test.de. We see the value that is like user agent, and then we can learn what the user agent is, and so on and so on. We have a little bit of a preamble here that tells us what to do, from where we're going to do this, and which, which, with which protocol we're going to do this. So this is relatively simple. And as you can see, those name value pairs are separated by two specific characters at the end of each line. Here we have the carriage return that sends the carriage back, and then we go to the next line, and then we have our stuff that is being parsed, carriage return, next line, carriage return, next line, and so on and so on. So that is easy and simple to understand and simple to parse. Here we have an HTTP response. In this response, we see the same scheme. Basically, we have a little bit of a preamble, and then we have the name value pairs that are specifying what the server is sending back to the client. Then we have a double carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed, and then we have the actual HTML that is marking up the document. You can see here that it's also quite simple. This one doesn't contain too much hyper because there is no anchors in there or anything interactive. It's just structured text. And as we can see, now a little bit more detail to be shared on HTML itself. We have another preamble. We have tags like the HTML tag, and then we have the body tag and the head tag uh, before the body tag. And inside the body tag, we have a headline one. And inside that headline one, we have, for whatever reason, an anchor that is pointing places. And that is like pretty much the element that is the hyper here, because that makes it hypertext. Again, very, very simple technology from the 90s that hasn't fundamentally changed over the past 30 years and we're still sitting on top of that and pretty much everything around us works using that technology. So you might notice, of course, that this is like highly resembling us of a mechanic instrument that we know as the typewriter. Because this whole idea of saying like, well, we have a protocol that basically has a line where there is a name and a value separated from one another with a colon, and then we have a carriage return and a line feed, and the next line starts. And you're like, hmm, I've heard about this somewhere before. And yes, of course, the typewriter. Because that is effectively pointing to the mechanical device where this would have been able to run on as well, like a teletyper or some kind of typewriting machine that has an actual mechanical carriage that, upon reaching the end of the line, goes back. It starts a new line, then you can type again, you push back the carriage, you go to the new line, and then you start typing again, and so on and so on. So this is like the fundamentals of how the web is working, basically typewriter stuff, which I find pretty crazy, but hey. So at the end of the day, a website as such, also as we know them today in many formats, is nothing else but a glorified newspaper. So we have like a piece of text that is supposed to be structured and we kind of enrich it with semantic elements of text, headlines, paragraphs, bold text, emphasized text, and so on, and the hyper stuff that is the anchors and the videos and the animated GIFs and potentially some JavaScript on top. So yeah, it kind of maybe feels a little bit already to you that we are building very, very modern things with a very, very ancient stack. We're building basically a skyscraper on top of some wooden foundations for buildings that were effectively meant to do something completely different than they do today. That maybe doesn't feel so great. So we need to think about where did this actually get us? Well, nothing but an actual digital newspaper, some form of text that is now being displayed in a more structured form. With HTML, we can prove the structure, and with HTTP, we can transport the whole thing from A to B, from client to server, and vice versa. And there is nothing else but that. In HTTP and HTML, we only have that structure and the transport thereof. There is no actual interactivity other than the anchors and images, so there is no actual JavaScript preamp limited in those particular standards. There is no authorization, there is no authentication. Back then we didn't have anything like this. There was no privacy, no encryption. It was pretty much just like plain text HTTP sent across from A to B. So to move away from having a static resource that only presents text for everybody to something more complex, which is a web application that produces information individualized for a user, we need, of course, something like authentication. A website or a server needs to recognize the person that is actually there and requesting the information if something individualized is supposed to be produced. So we need to make that technology better. And in those situations when we need to make technology better, we oftentimes have different paths that we can take. 
we can take path one, which is the hard path, and we can say, well, we built something, we specify it, we launch it, then we analyze how people are using it, what we're gonna do in the next years, we learn, we improve, we maybe kind of start the whole thing with a lean prototype, minimum set of features of work, we keep scalability in mind, and we improvise, uh, improve, improve, sorry, we improve wisely if we don't build blockers into the technology that is keeping us from doing certain things and helps us to kind of have something that still works in 20 years, as mentioned in the presentation earlier, that is something that we want to have. Or we can choose path number two. Just like patch stuff on top and not care about tomorrow. We don't waste time, we just like implement stuff and we come up with new ideas. We also have a race situation where there's just like Microsoft versus Netscape and we have to be faster than the others because otherwise they're gonna steal market shares from us. And we build immediately, we don't think, we just like implement on top, like there is no tomorrow. And, uh, well, what kind of path have we actually taken for HTML and HTTP and the web in general? Was it path one or was it path two? What, 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 what are your thoughts? I see lots of people doing like this. Yes, of course, it was path two. Just like rigorously and just like ruthlessly patching stuff on top and see what happens. And that is what we have right now. That's, that's the web as we have it right now. We could have had fantastic fine dining approaches with a well-composed menu and just like really delicious stuff that lasts us for the next 20 years and beyond and fantastic technology that scales that makes sense. But no, we chose to go the fast food path. I mean, this is still tasty, that looks tasty, good burgers, but uh, we could have spent a little bit more time actually thinking about the stuff that we're doing here and building something reasonable and going for like a proper six course menu and not just the burger over at Burger King or McDonald's or wherever you have them. Well, but we did so. We rage patched on top. We wanted to kind of urgently go from newspaper to web application, but we missed all the technology. We missed authentication, authorization, we missed privacy and encryption, all that stuff wasn't there. So we were like, ah, let's not bake it into the protocols because that would be hard and take a long time and then others are gonna do this faster than us in a dirty way and that's gonna be the way that's gonna be chosen by everyone. No, let's, gonna do, this, let's, go, let's do this as quickly as possible. And, uh, well, I mean, in the early day, when we talk about authentication, you probably still remember HTTP basic auth, like these operat operating system generated pop-ups that would just like show on your screen and ask you for username and password, and then all that stuff would be transmitted obfuscatedly using base64. Wow, that was obfuscation at first. And then people came up with the idea of saying like, ooh, we're gonna steal some technology that some other people have already built and we're gonna call it cookies. And we're gonna put it into the browser and they're gonna put a patent on it and then someone else put another patent on it and that was like big drama. But another thing that was just like dirtily patched into the existing technologies and no one thought about how terrible this could actually end. And cookies are a disaster in web security. So why do we still have cookies? Because we don't have anything better. And we basically blocked our path to have something better because that technology is so proprietary and so exclusive that we can't get out of this again. And with privacy and encryption in the browser, we actually took a different, uh, a similar path. In the early days, we started off realizing, well, we kind of want to have some privacy, so someone on the transport channel can't see what we transport from A to B, so let's cook up something that we call SNP, Secure Network Programming. And that was pretty much like the predecessor to the uh, SSL and TLS technologies that we have today. Then we built SSL, patched it on top of HTTP on an actual different layer, and then slowly we realized that all the crypto is garbage that is being used there, that new versions had to come out over and over again. And uh, finally, we are at a point where we can say, well, this sort of works. We still have like the CAs and all this incredibly messy system out there, but hey, thanks to Let's Encrypt and some people take initiative, it's not that terrible anymore. We have a decent version with TLS 1.3 and so on, it's like fine-ish. It's not good, but it's better. And uh, well, this was probably fine for most of the applications out there. More secure and privacy fee in London newspapers and websites, but how come out e-commerce and finance and banking? Was it good enough for that as well? Were those patched together technologies fine enough for those highly critical applications? Well, not. Really, but we're gonna talk about that in a second. 
To summarize this chapter one, because we're already at the end of chapter one, we started off really bad with the web. Like that was a disaster. Like that situation where there's just like the major browser vendors, Microsoft and Netscape, and lots of smaller ones back then were fighting against one another and trying to be as quick as possible with feature implementations that would block the other, block the other party, that was bad. We also did a terrible thing with the web, and that is like we fetishized backwards compatibility. Everything had to be backwards compatible, and that's a terrible idea. Look at Windows. They had to fight with this problem for such a long time, and still do. Look at Office software, which is a nightmare. There's just like gigabytes of software that all aim to be backwards compatible, supporting stuff that no one needs anymore. Internet Explorer comes to mind as well, which was such a bloated monster of features, and all of them had vulnerabilities. I was working with Team Tango back then from Microsoft and we tested IE for a couple of years and the result was 962 vulnerabilities that we found, like a team of three people. Unimaginable, 962. Yes, ActiveX, a dream technology. I, I wish ActiveX would come back, that, that would be amazing. ActiveX and Chrome, oh, chef kiss. Anyway, and we hope all will be fine. Because we only kind of look at tomorrow, but not the day after tomorrow, or even next week, or even next year. And uh, we just like go with the flow. And I think it's something that we can label as quite human, can't we? I mean, this is just like human behavior. It's like, well, strategy and thinking ahead a long time. And just like still keeping market shares. I don't really know. Let's make a small modification and see how it works and roll with the punches. So let's talk about, for example, money and crime and the World Wide Web, as we saw it back then and as we still soon see it today. Large parts of the internet and the WWW handle money, of course, this or the other way. We can buy things, we can sell things, we can auction things, we can store money, we can send money, we can receive money, we can earn money, we can lose money. It's all about money. Like the whole advertising industry is all about money and like vast parts of the World Wide Web have to do with making or losing money. And that, of course, means if we have like that bad of the technological underpinnings and uh, framework, that this is very attractive for cybercrime or for criminals in general. And to be quite frank, and this hurts my teeth a little bit to say this, and maybe you agree and maybe you don't agree, but it's close to impossible not to become a victim online. Banks, like the whole technology stack is completely screwed. Fintechs, we audited so many of them. Every single time we find a critical authentication issues or time of check, time of use issues or race conditions, people could be screwed. E-commerce, they don't even care anymore because they have insurances. Screwed. It happened to me as a very paranoid person at least twice to get compromised and to lose money from my bank. I'm waking up in the morning, I'm checking my bank account for random reasons and I'm seeing like that there's tons of transactions just like leaving my account then I have to call people, block my cards. My bank says like, ooh, you have to walk to the police office, I have to file a complaint against Anonymous, then I have to copy that, send this over to the bank, create a list of items that got stolen, which is totally fun if it's like 600 items in total that I see on my account having disappeared. And uh, well, it happened twice. How is that even possible? And the bank even doesn't care. I called them and they were like, yeah, don't worry about this. You're going to get your money back. We're insured. So they don't even have to have cybersecurity because the insurances are covering that for them. Of course, they're trying and there's regulations, but the need is not as urgent as it could be. So that's not great. That's me. Um, I, I created a Laura of myself when playing with Stable Diffusion and uh, tried to kind of make myself a gangster. But hey, um, let's ignore this. So summing up chapter one, as mentioned, we did not exactly do well in the past 30 years. Actually, we quite sucked a lot with building the technology that everybody is working on today. We have been building on top of a very bad foundation. We have been recklessly pushing new features. We have been past the point of no return. And uh, we're really struggling today to keep things at bay. And we kind of get what we deserve, no? Because uh, we have like a whole industry living off that. We have nonsense products that are sold for security. AV, in my opinion, complete nonsense. Most of the firewalls and web application firewalls, in my eyes, complete nonsense. And we have like still billions in financial losses of people all over the world who trust that the web is safe and then realize that it's not. And that somewhere in that gigantic stack there is a vulnerability and they get exploited. And I guess if we don't change something fundamentally, this is how things likely will remain. Anyone disagree so far? Cool, that's good. <laughs> or is it? I don't know, let's see. So, then we have, of course, the topic of crypto coins. Hallelujah. Now everything is fine because we have like 
a way stronger framework underneath with crypto and lots of additional benefits. And I really believe that there's lots and lots and lots of benefits. And it's fantastic. That solves a lot, at least from the commercial and the money handling angle. We have decentralization. We have financial inclusion for people who have problems getting a bank close by. We have transparency and accountability. We have cross-border transactions. We have innovation and disruption and lots of good things that are also to it. And needless to say, we have security and privacy because the use of crypto coins enhances security and privacy by utilizing cryptographic techniques. Hmm, does it really? Let's have a look at the numbers. So the quotations that I found is that uh, up until 2021, several billion dollars worth of cryptocurrencies have been stolen in various cyber attacks and hacks. According to a report by CypherTrace, nearly 1.9 billion in cryptocurrency was stolen in 2020 alone. These figures included thefts from exchanges, scams, and other forms of misappropriation of funds. That's a lot of money. And also, traditional bank heists have decreased significantly in recent years due to improvements in security systems and the digitalization of banking services. According to the FBI, I didn't make this up, the FBI did. In 2010, there was like 5,628 reported bank robberies in the United States, resulting in losses of approximately 43 million. Not billion, just million. By 2019, those numbers had decreased to 2,160 robberies with losses of roughly 22 million. So the number of money stolen in traditional ways goes down, whereas the number of money stolen using the cryptocurrency path goes up. Something seems to be off here. Let's look into the details, and you probably know most of these instances. In 2014, oh my god, that, yeah, Mt. Gox, like this, this I'm, I, mean, I don't have any words. If you don't know about this, please read up. It's a tragic story. I'm not going to get into the details. Then more and more and more compromises. Bitfinex, CoinCheck, CoinRails, I've Bitthumb, Binance, QCoin, and Poly Network. And you might notice some similarities between those. Because oftentimes the attack was not against the protocols or the cryptographic underpinnings, but against the actual stack where the technology was presented with. More. We have, for example, coin wallet attacks in the past. And here's a non-exhaustive list that I, that I assembled. 2012, Bitcoinica, Bitfloor, Inputs.io, Bitpay, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, Parity, Bancor, and MetaMask through phishing attacks. Well, that's kind of not their fault. But again, we can see similarities and we can notice that lots of those attacks that were successful did not have anything to do with the crypto itself, but again with the stack where the whole thing is sitting on top. So maybe this is where we should kind of look into. So what we assumed we would get when patching things quickly was this, but what we actually get was these disgusting rotten burgers based on this rotten stack that I described earlier on these ancient technologies that we rely on that we never kind of dared touching. And now you might wonder, but how does all that relate? Like you're talking about the web and burgers and all these things. Like what is, where do those two things connect in this presentation? And this is where we're actually gonna talk about right now. I am wondering, why do we actually here use the web and the related technologies such as HTTP and HTML and especially browsers for a new technology with such noble intent and such a well-thought framework underneath? Why do we run this on a stack that is obviously rotten and not suitable for this? Why do we expose our key assets to decades of insecurity, to potentially insecure servers, to potentially insecure operating systems, data stores, frameworks, applications, transport mediums, endpoints, and even insecure neighborhood? Like if, for example, LastPass gets compromised and someone steals the keys and then uses the data to actually attack other people's wallets, that means that even if you do everything right, someone else does something wrong and people will still steal your stuff. So not even the neighborhood is good in which we are. And last but not least, we don't seem to have any backup plan here. Gone is gone. If, if something gets stolen from me from the bank, I get it back because they're insured. They don't really care. The insurance cares maybe, but hey, not my problem. But here, potentially, there's no backup plan. Gone means gone. So I'm wondering, like, what are we all doing? Why are we relying on those terrible technologies for something so cool that we're building here? And even just storage. Storage is the worst. I keep getting that question. Well, we want to get rid of cookies. Is it fine to use local storage in the browser? No, it's not. It's not ever fine to use local storage in the browser. First, local storage has no expiration mechanics, has 
a weird SOP implementation. It remains in the browser for eternity. If you're sitting on a shared PC, there's nothing you can do. Don't use local storage. So we haven't even figured out the storage aspect of all it. Because people either use cookies or local storage or something even worse. And it says clearly in the specifications, don't put sensitive info into local storage because other people can potentially and will see it and do bad stuff with it. And it's a common finding in Pentas reports. So I'm tempted to think and this is where it might get controversial, and it's perfectly okay if you disagree with me. So this is an impulse talk and not introducing new research, something like this. Maybe all this, what we're doing here, does not belong in the world of HTML and HTTP unless that stuff is fixed. Maybe you should move away from the old typewriter that is using carriage return and line feeds to get information across. Maybe we should just like don't, not do this. If we can send satellites into space, which is amazing, can we not also build like a secure execution platform? I mean, how much more expensive can it be to develop something that can securely execute these kinds of things versus putting something up into space? So we obviously have the resources. And let's maybe think about more proof and more numbers before we come to the conclusion of this talk. Let's count vulnerabilities in browsers. How many vulnerabilities were flagged with a CVE, meaning were actually published by the uh, 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 authors or by the maintainers and are right now categorized for Chrome? This is like 2,649. And another critical was just released yesterday that was, I think, in the WebP implementation. 2,649 issues. You might argue more bugs are good because if someone finds them, they get fixed. But it also means where there is so many, there are more and still we trust that environment. Firefox, same thing. 2,206 CVEs and counting. And even if you take the worst possible software that is out there that no one would ever install, even at gunpoint, Adobe Reader, which is the most insecure thing that you can install, they even have fewer CVEs than the two browsers. Can you imagine that? Like we're trusting something that is less secure and has more issues than the freaking Adobe Reader. Like, would you kind of put your wallet into Adobe Reader? I don't think so. So, and now to conclude this presentation, and I'm really already completely riled up here, how, how can we fix this? Like, how to even, how to even get out of this mess? I don't know, I, I really don't know. So here's a question from me to you, and that is, you probably all hold assets. Do you think that right now your assets are secure? Who, like, raise your hand if you think that your assets are secure, that no one can obtain them who shouldn't be able to obtain them. One person thinks that. Fantastic. I would actually also raise my hand. I also think that they are secure right now. Let me extend that question. Who here thinks, come on, oh, sorry. <laughs> who here thinks that the assets are secure if it's known to the attacker how you protected them? So I know how I protected mine, and... I came up with some obscure path, but I don't feel comfortable telling you. You, you say you, you still feel they're secure even if you tell me. That's fantastic, but there's only one person believing this. So that can get us to the point of believing that the security feeling that we have here is maybe also at least a little bit based on obscurity as in like, as long as you don't know how I secure my coins, they are secure, but if I tell you how I do so, well, then maybe I'm not that super sure anymore. And that's perfectly fair. I would also say the same. So we need to tackle a lot of things here. We need to kind of tackle a lot of stuff when dealing with wallets. We need to tackle storage, authentication, accessibility, recoverability, affordability, availability, and so many other things. And well, of course, browsers kind of already do that for us. At least they provide a loosely coupled framework for doing those things. So we're gonna be like, yeah, why not use browsers? One small anecdote, like the other day I was opening my IDE, Eclipse, and I noticed that there's like balloon help if I hover certain functions, and I realized that if I put HTML into a function comment, then in the balloon help in the IDE, this will be rendered. People use browsers everywhere for everything, and that's bad. I don't wanna have a Safari engine or WebKit engine in my IDE to render balloon help because the developers were, pardon me, too lazy to implement bold text. There is no need for this. Do we really have to choose the browser as the least secure vehicle for all the things that we do? I don't know. There's too many requirements that the browser seemingly satisfies, but does it really and does it do so in a secure way or is it just convenient? 
So maybe we need to kind of divide and conquer. We need to kind of store something here and store something there to kind of connect also to the MPC uh, uh, idea of this conference. We use multiple authentication or multi-factor authentication. We might have to use multiple devices and so on and so on. And so how far is this away from me actually going to my bank branch and my village and just saying like, it's me, I wanna pick the money. Like it's not that far away because we have to have so many complicated processes. Like there is even a word that is called multi-factor authentication fatigue for people who get sick of it. So, uh, well, I mean, we do all this already. We have hardware wallets, we have desktop wallets, we have mobile wallets, which I think is still like the superior path here. We have paper wallets and we have physical coins and all those things that kind of make it easier for us to manage our funds and to secure our funds. And that is great, it's not very convenient and what the browser offers is always more convenient. So I'm wondering, what can we do to move away from the terrible framework that the browser is and build something better? And I'm wondering, is anyone here who's maintaining like a wallet that is using the browser as, as like via an add-on or as a web application itself or some other means? Yes. How, how do you handle that? Because my understanding is that it's really, really hard and that you have to go so many extra miles. How do you, how do, you do this? Do, do you feel confident with how it works or do you see like, well, we also see that the browser is kind of a little bit shaky, so that's what it is. What's, what's your take on this? Yeah. That is exactly also my point. It's complicated. And uh, technically it's weird because we shouldn't be asking those questions. We shouldn't be like 30 years past the inauguration of HTTP and still be plagued by its pitfalls and by its caveats. Like we shouldn't be here. We should have something better by now. And my proposal is, and it's, it's a daring proposal, I know this, and that is like let's ditch the browser as a vehicle for doing all the coin stuff. We can maybe wait for the broken leg to heal, but I don't, I don't think it's gonna heal. Um, I am part of some standardization uh, groups and I know how hard it is to get a standard into the browser. It's a nightmare. We're working on the sanitizer standard and it's so depressing. No. We can maybe stop putting cream and band-aids on top and uh, make like a massive and more daring leap with regards to technology than the browser can currently support. We can also wait until the stack heals itself, but we cannot really afford this because we want to do stuff in the meantime. We want to innovate. We want to kind of push things forward. So I think what needs to be done is effectively something radical. We need to kind of come up with a way of no longer relying on the browser or contributing to the browser in a way that actually turns it into a vehicle that is capable of handling the whole thing. And that holds for the rest of the stack as well. So my wish would be and maybe I'm wrong or maybe I'm naive, but my wish would be that some of the resources that go into amazing innovations right now, as we saw in the talks earlier, also goes into repairing the things that we already have that we have to rely on because we don't have anything better or start building something new that gets us rid of this particular codependency because that would be valid and awesome as well. And uh, this is pretty much all that I have. I hope it wasn't too annoying and I hope you could agree with some of my points. Thank you very much and uh, questions please. I think we have time for just the one question, but I think that was a lot of, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was the coffee substitute. No, we have coffee outside, I'm joking, sorry. Uh, we have time for one question. No, wow, that was very clear. I, I see the one hand from Moshe, just the one question. It's not really a question, it's more like a comment. It's not really fair to compare CV of like other breeder to like open source software. I agree. <laughs> That's all. I mean, I needed some numbers and well, Chrome is not exactly open source, it's like open source ish. So that one is a stronger candidate than Firefox. But I fully agree with you, those numbers are not really, they don't hold much weight, but they at least point in a direction that supports my claim. But you're perfectly right. Great, uh, we will have coffee outside, but we're not going to quite break. Thank you so much for your time, Mario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.